Welcome to Unicon webinar on Open Aquella. Today, we're going to do a quick round of introductions. And then we'll have an overview of Open Aquella. Talk a little bit about the differences between Aquella versus Open Aquella. And then we are going to hear from a longtime adopter of Aquella about their use cases at BYU Idaho. And then we will do a quick wrap up and then open it up for any questions. That the, uh, that the participants might have. So in the way of introductions, my name is Chris Beach. I am the Unicon Open Aquila Tech Lead, and more generally, my role as a software developer at Unicon. With me today presenting is Matt Miles. He is a web librarian at BYU Idaho and easily uh, can be considered a power user of Aquila. So what is Open Aquila like? Just, you know, when you get thrown in there and you want to ask, you know, what, what is this software it can do? What can it do for me? Um, I've heard it described like a utility knife. Uh, you, can, you can open up a tool and use it. Um, you can use the application in diff many different scenarios. Um, and it's, it's all available there. You can turn it off if you need to. Um, and it kind of stays out of the way. But if you want it to all work together, that works as well. I've heard it described as a box of building blocks, which you know you can it would allow adopters to build as little or as much configuration into their structure or into their offering for their um, to their learners um, as they need. Uh, you can then and think about building a like a Lego structure, right? Uh, you can you can build up the initial thing and then you can customize it. You can tear it down a little and build something else up. You can do it iteratively. Um, and you can continue to have that value add of the um, of the structure and your lessons learned. Um, and Aquila is similar to that with the ability to do so much custom, uh, configuration and customization. And then I've also heard it um, in reference to the Soyuz spacecraft. Um, Matt will talk a little bit more about this. Um, you know, it may not be the flashes option. O Open Aquella admittedly has a UI that needs some, some updating and there's active development work being worked on for that. Um, but it is a mature offering for content management, especially in the learning space. It's versatile for a lot of different scenarios and it's reliable. It's been around for a while. So let's take a step back and ask ourselves, you know, why would I even need a learning object repository? Now, admittedly, there is not, you know, not 100% of institutions would always need a learning object repository, but I would say the majority of them will. And because you always have content that you want to share with your learners. So a learning object repository should allow content to be free from imposed technological restrictions, secure behind a permissions model, facilitate tagging and indexing to enable a high degree of content reuse, enable workflows to curate content, and provide integration points into presentation their application to facilitate a seamless hub of content. I wanted to touch on just a few of those points. Um, being free from imposed technological restrictions, your business cases, the paths that you want your learners to take, should drive how you interact with the learning repository, or in, in, well, any of your applications, but um, in specific, your learning object repository. Making sure it's behind a permissions model, um, you don't always want all your content to be accessible to everyone um, all the time. And so you need to be able to um, have switches and knobs to be able to change when and how your content is viewed. You want to be able to tag and index your content um, in a customizable way. Right, not one size fits all. The things that I think might be important in, say, my institution for tagging a piece of content can be vastly different than what your needs are. And so you want to be able to have that, that repository and be able to adapt to your specific use case. You want to have your, uh, your repository have workflows. Um, you want to have a, an ability to vet your content and your metadata before it goes out to your end users. Quality control, copyright checking, plagiarism, whatever you're concerned about, you need to be able to make sure that your, your learning object repository helps you out in that sense and doesn't just 
open up um, open up scope for the concerns of did my content get out there before it should. And then lastly, providing integration points. When you look at where educational technology is going, um, the, it is more of you want an application to do something really well and then be able to integrate with other applications that do their bit very well and to be able to then create this, this ecosystem. Um, and so you can look at your learning object repository as your hub of content, and it needs to be able to provide those integration points into learning management systems, into portals, into data warehouses, so you can effectively use the content and the analytics that are, that are flowing through the learning object repository. And so we'd like you to take a moment to consider Open Aquella for your learning object repository. It was initially conceived as one, um, and throughout the years, it's been customized, um, or it's, it has customizations available in it to allow it to be more of a general content management repository, but it's also specific enough to target the education space. It is configurable at, um, at the level of when you just need a basic repository with you know, a basic wizard for contribution and then showing your data and tagging it. Um, but then you can go the next level deeper and you can customize it. Um, it. Aquila hosts a powerful scripting API that can, it can really um, have a tight integration with your business needs. Um, it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all, um, it's a you customize it to fit your needs. And so how customizable is it, right? It's easy enough to say that something's customizable, but what does that really mean? For Open Aquella, flexibility and customization is, is in pretty much every component of Aquella. From your schemas, where you can choose a Dublin Core, LOM, a customized hybrid of both. You can have just a completely custom schema to your resource contribution and display with a single wizard page or different widgets to completely um, um, custom widgets where you script them yourself. Um, how you display the resource to your workflows where you can have a single node or a complex workflow with multiple branches um, and decision points. You can have, um, you, can, you can customize your searching and indexing to be able to say these specific nodes need to be able to be indexed and indexed in this way. Um, your browse hierarchies, maybe your users don't even know what they want to search for. And so you can set up your browse hierarchies to guide your users to, to, um, to content sets. Um, harvesting allows the flexibility of Aquila to become an index time federated search engine where you set your harvesting against other um, external sources, other open Aquila installs, um, other repositories that are not even open Aquila, and it will, um, it will import as a kind of an automated background process. It will import that content and you'll have just have it available through the Aquila search APIs. It's flexible in its reporting structure. You can choose to have it um, report through a data warehouse and you can turn off reports, or you can, you can choose to make your reports be incredibly customized in terms of anything you can do with SQL, you can pretty much do with reports. It's a burp report engine, and so it's, it's built upon SQL. And then last, but definitely not the least, um, Open Aquila security and permissions is, um, is, is truly one of the gems of Open Aquila, I feel, is that you can take permissions and you can assign um, the permissions at a very high level to a very granular level um, from an institution line to down to the specific resource, and you can assign it to um, a various levels of, um, of user management from the users, groups, or roles. And each of these permissions, um, there's a lot of permissions that cover pretty much anything you would possibly want to do inside of Open Aquila to allow, um, to, again, it's to allow that your business needs are able to be met without the application um, imposing how it thinks it should handle. So what are the differences then between Aquila and Open Aquila? 
Well, Aquella is the name of the commercial software um, that was recently open source. It was open source last year. Um, it required a license, and so it it was effectively you know a cost, and that's how you got your support and and enhancements, and bugs fixes, and those kind of things. It was controlled by a single entity. Most recently, it was um, Pearson Educators. Um, there was a single support channel, um, and it was Sunset last year. Uh, Pearson was willing to open source it, and through Unicon and um, and a large support by Edelex as well, they open sourced it through the Aperio Foundation. And and it was also had to be rebranded at that time. So when you hear Aquila and open Aquila, functionally, hardly anything was lost uh, when when open Aquila was um, well when the code was migrated, converted to open Aquila to the open source software. Uh, there was quite a few backend changes that were made, um, but not really a whole lot of functionality lost. Um, be, since it is open now. Anyone can join the effort to enhance the software. Uh, you don't have to be part of the commercial service providers that are set up to support Aquella um, at that commercial level. Um, you can go ahead and just enhance the software yourself or for your institution if you need. Um, however, it is supported by a community and several commercial service providers. Uh, these commercial service providers are more regionally based around the globe um, and they have um, experts that came from um, from supporting and enhancing Aquella in its commercial days, they're now part of um, those commercial service providers. And so while the community is fairly young, since it's only about a year old, um, the expertise that is available out there to enhance and support Aquella is fairly mature. And there is active development going on with Open Aquella right now. Um, some of those things, there's been some security fixes that have, were, um, were identified in Aquila and have been fixed in Open Aquila. Um, there's active developments in taking the UI. I mentioned that the UI needed essentially a fairly serious refresh, um, and that's happening now um, using Google Material Design. It's a work in progress, but if you download the latest code right now, you will see um, the prototype of that. And then there's some enhancements with workflow and notification that just makes Quella that much more flexible um, and um, more useful when you try when you work to mold it to your business cases. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Matt Miles. Um, he is going to talk about his experiences with implementing Aquella at BYU Idaho. Well, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, Chris did a great job of outlining kind of the overview, high-level overview of Equella, and I'm going to try to give you some specific use cases to help you understand how it might be used at your institution. So at BYU-Idaho, um, we had a number of things that we were trying to solve. And before I talk about those, I want to talk a little bit about the Soyuz spacecraft. This is an article that appeared in The Guardian. As you know, we, the space shuttle program in the U.S. was, was uh, discontinued. We don't currently have a spacecraft, but the Soviet-built uh, Soyuz craft is still being used. And in fact, recently, the Soyuz was in the news. Um, Second, it's not responding to my. Can you give me the? There we go. I wanted to make a little comparison between the two. So the Soyuz was uh, first developed in 1967, and it flew 1,887 missions, about more or less. They're still flying them, so that number is still increasing. The space shuttle flew 135. But what I want you to pay closest attention to is those numbers in yellow. So the space shuttle had its first serious accident in 1986. 14 people were killed. And then years later, many years later, they had another accident. The Soyuz, in contrast, had one accident, uh, one fatality in 67, and then there were three more in 71. However, there haven't been any fat fatalities since that time. 
this points to some serious differences of design. And I'm always really interested in the design, whether it be software or cars or any kind of a device. The problem with the space shuttle is that it was so complex that they never really ironed out all the bugs. The design was such that in the 86 accident, a O-ring was the cause, a small O-ring that failed was the cause of the, uh, of the first accident. And in 2003, one of the tiles came off the space shuttle as it was being launched, and that tile uh, came in contact with the wing of the space shuttle on re-entry, the aluminum skin uh, was breached and, and the space shuttle was lost. Now, the Soyuz was designed in such a way that they were able to iron out the problems early and has been a proven performer now for over 50 years. And recently, uh, the Soyuz was in the news because on October 12th, the uh, the the uh, there was a flight that took that took place. There was one uh, American astronaut and one Russian cosmonaut at about thirty miles in the air. There was a problem with the uh, launch, and the space shuttle does not have a way to abort once the rockets have been ignited. The Soyuz, they had an abort system built into it. So at 30,000 feet, it aborted. This is the capsule that they came down in. And as you can see, this doesn't look like a super high-tech device. However, it served the purpose very well. Both of the, uh, the cosmonaut, the astronaut, they both survived with just very minor injuries. So I use that to talk about Equella because it's been in existence now for over 15 years. Um, it's not the flashiest option, but it does the things that it needs to do very well. We don't really think about it too much here at BYU-Idaho because its downtime is probably measured in seconds over a semester. All of the core things work, and as we've learned about it, it's versatile to do much more than act as just a learning object repository, although it does that quite well, which is its, was its main purpose. Um, we had a couple problems we were trying to solve. The first was that we had content spread out in all these different places, and we wanted to unify that content, whether as much as possible, whether it be faculty created content, um, some institutional content, things from AV services, um, some library subscription content, and also things that were spread out on uh, people's Dropbox and Box accounts. So the way that we did that was to go out and look at content management systems, and Equella was really the only one that we felt would have a chance of doing that. The other problem that we had was that we didn't have any institutional control of our, of our assets because of the fact that the content was spread out in so many different places. Um, the content wasn't tagged, so it was difficult to find. You couldn't search it. Uh, you had to search in different places. We didn't know when certain uh, content produced by faculty uh, you know, whether it violated any kind of license agreements, and then things that were licensed, where they paid the licensing, they didn't have a good way to secure those items, especially if they were in a box or Dropbox account. So we couldn't control who should see that content. And this was a, this was a fairly big deal because we really wanted to reduce the risk of any type of litigation. So those were our, our two main problems that we were trying to solve with this. And I kind of break it down into these four bullet points. With, with the Equella, you can find your stuff, you can have institutional control of your stuff, and you can provide context by tagging. You can also repurpose your stuff. And uh, I have a little video clip that I won't show there by uh, Chamath Palihapitiya. He is a venture capitalist who was an early executive at Facebook 
and he's broken off and he's doing his own thing now. Uh, I think his company is called Human Capital. But in this video, he talks about all of the images that um, are in the iCloud, all of the, all those different things, images, photos that people take, put up there. And he said, that's great, but you know, a couple million images aren't much good to you if they don't have context, if they're not tagged. It's the tagging or the interpretation of the data that makes it valuable. And if you just have your data on a file server of some kind like Box or Dropbox, you don't have that context that you want. So with that, let me go into some uh, use cases. Now, there is software out there for special collections and archives. Well, as I mentioned before, we were trying to reduce the number of content systems that we had. So one of our use cases was to put our items in special collections into Equella, in their own uh, collection within Equella. And this here, by the way, is a picture of the Tetons from the Idaho site. So in Equella, you create what's called a contribution, which acts like a container. You don't have to have a container with metadata and only have one item in it. So for example, I've tagged this group of pieces of content. They're images of cuneiform that we have in our special collections. And uh, it made sense to group these together. So when someone searches on image of cuneiform, they can click on this and, they, and each of the uh, items in blue is a separate object. And so then when they click on those objects, they can see the individual ones, they can page through them. Here's an example of one of them. If I wanted to use this or share it with someone, I could simply copy the URL and send it to uh, someone in an email. I could put it in my course management system. Um, and then, as Chris mentioned before, with permissions, I can control who sees this. So in our special collections, this is something that we provide freely to anyone. There are no restrictions on it. And another nice feature of Equella is it will selectively allow uh, Google to index your content if it's made public and not if it's made private. So this is a public object that if someone were searching for cuneiform out on the web, they could potentially be brought in and see this. Let me show you uh, another example. Our faculty, this was a difficult uh, prospect to get our faculty to, to actually put their content into the content management system without being compelled to do so. We don't force them to do it. We've gone out and tried to teach them about the, you know, the advantages of doing it, and we've had success with a number of them. Probably one of the groups we've been most successful with is our Russian department. Now this is an Equella contribution uh, for Russian 101, 102, and 201. Now, I, I make a note of that because in a course management system, say Canvas or Blackboard, people say, well, I don't really need to put my content outside of it because I, if I have multiple sections of a course, I can just have a master course and have one object, and then it can be used in all those um, derivative courses. However, in this case, that would not work because this is used in not just one class, it's used in three different classes. So if you were to put this in your learning management system, you'd have to have three copies of it. In this case, we have one copy that's used in not just uh, multiple sections of a course, but in multiple courses. Another nice thing about Quella is this is an example of where the first item, the 101 student website, is a web page. You can host web pages in Equella. You can, you can create your own and upload them, or you can use the simple WYSIWYG editor. The second one is a PDF. So you can create a, a compound learning object. So you have a container here, an Equella contribution with multiple items on it. And just to see what that looks like, this is the web page. And each of these links is a link to another web page in Equella or a PDF file or 
audio, you can host audio clips in Equella as well. And we do that for audio clips that are less than five minutes. If they're bigger than that, then we put them into a streaming server. But it handles uh, small video clips just fine using pseudo streaming. Let's go on to the next part here. These are just, I'm just showing you pictures of our local area. This is a hike over in Teton Valley uh, this last spring. Equella, as I mentioned, it has a high level of versatility, which I have found in no other content management system. Most content management systems, you can upload a piece of content and tag it, and that's great, but in Equella, you can actually upload an entire web application with multiple files. Uh, they could be, you know, you could CSS, JavaScript, uh, images, and HTML pages. You could upload those to a contribution, and Equella will deliver them just like a web server would, but you get the additional benefits of being able to apply permissions to these different objects to control who sees them, which is much more difficult to do if you're just using a web server because you have to get other people involved in the permissions. With this, the users can set their own permissions on who they want to see their stuff. And so let me show you one of these uh, anatomy and phys physiology active resources, the Skull Lab. Um, and this is used in about 40 sections of this course. It gets many thousands of hits every semester. So here's the Quell contribution we've created. And we've uploaded all of the uh, files necessary, and, and including in subfolders, for this learning object. And then we just create a link to the entry page. Okay, we don't show all the other files that are behind this. We only show the one to the entry page. And we can tag it, as you see here, so that other people can find it and use it. And this is what this looks like when you launch it. It uses JavaScript, as I mentioned. There's some sound files, some CSS, and some HTML. And as the students click on these different options under the skull, it will show different images and highlight the specific part of the, uh, of the skull. Let's move on to show you Equella Sync. Now also, as Chris mentioned, one of the complaints people have about Equella is the interface you know, looks old. And I won't disagree with that. However, this was not an imped impediment to me adopting the product you know, after I did a, you know, a, a run through, a technological run through and discovered all of the in, you know, incredible functionality that's there. This is uh, Yellowstone Park, by the way. It's about 80 miles from Rexburg, where we live. Um, but we did have a problem with faculty wanting to adopt. They, they didn't want to use the web interface. They weren't that excited about using it. So what we've done is we've created a application that runs on your computer called Equella Sync. We've shared the code with Unicon. We're open sourcing it so other libraries can adopt it. We call it Equella Sync. And when you install Equella Sync on your computer, what it does is it makes a connection to Equella using your Equella account. And when it does that, it can see all of the applications that you own on Equella. It allows you to then download the files in those contributions on Equella to your local machine, a copy of those. So then what happens is, here's an example, uh, Health Science 450 book excerpts. So there's an Equella contribution. And let me go to this next screen here. These are all of the items. They're all PDFs and doc files that exist in that folder. So what I do if I want to edit one of those, I don't have to go onto the web and edit it. All I have to do is open this document on my local machine. So here's just a simple text file, and I've written this as a test. And when I click Save, it uploads the latest version to Equella. Now, if I have that file linked in my course management system, I don't have to go into my course management system to change it. I don't even have to go into Equella and change it. I can manage all of my files that I use in my courses 
from my local machine just using Equalis Sync. And that has really helped us with faculty adoption. Let me go on to uh, show you exactly how you might use Equella with a learning management system. Here I have an Equella contribution called Grand Teton Trip 2018. Uh, we took a group of scouts uh, up to the top of the Grand Teton, and I wanted a way to distribute these. Um, I made them all public so that you know people who didn't have a BYU Idaho account could access them, and I just loaded all of these images into this contribution. So let's say that I wanted to share this contribution in a course. Well, I could just right click on any of these links, copy the link. Now we're currently using Canvas, and here is uh, adding a external URL in Canvas. You can see the URL points to that Equella item. I give it a name. And I like to load things in a new tab. And the reason I do that is because if a students like to access their course management system on their phones, sometimes if you have embedded content from external sites, they don't always look correctly or scroll properly. Anyway, so then I click Add Item. And then you can see in Canvas, under Modules, I have this General Course Information Module. And then below that, there is my link to the Tetons. If a student wanted to see that, they would simply click on it. And this is a view coming up Garnet Canyon at the middle Teton. And if you look at the red arrow, it's just showing that it's pointing to that Equella contribution. That is the link to the external resource. Now, there is LTI integration that works quite nicely with Canvas. Some people prefer to just copy the links, others like to use the integration piece. And the way that this works is if you look on the left, you can enable an option in Equal, and I'm sorry, in Canvas to select resources from Equella. When you do that, you can search Equella right inside of Canvas. So I've searched on CS364, the items for that course, and this third item in the course, uh, if I click on that, now before I go there, look on the far right, there's a pane that shows all of my modules that I have in my sandbox course. Okay, so those display on the right, you get your content in the middle. So I select CS364 Software Engineer course, and notice that now I have a plus sign next to each of these pieces of content. There's also a plus sign next to the contribution, the top level contribution. So I can provide a link to the top level contribution in my course, or I can select individual items, okay? I've selected the software engineering module on the right before I start doing this. It's highlighted in yellow. So then what happens is as I click each of those plus signs, uh, that number will increment. You see there's a one, I actually clicked on three items to put into the software engineering module. Then you click the save button, and then you can see within Canvas under modules, I have a software engineering resources module and there are three, the three items that I added to that module using the integration. And then I just clicked on one of them and it launches this external website or, or web page, you notice that this is coming from Equella. I'm not aware of any other content management system that gives you this level of flexibility where you can mix, you can load up files, but you can also generate entire websites and web pages and web, app, web applications and put them inside of an Equella contribution. It's really an incredible uh, functionality that you know, a lot of people never get to because all they do is look at the current Equella interface. All right, let's move on. To, now, just to recap, and then we'll have some questions if you want. Why content management with Equella? Well, and let me just say open Equella. You can find your stuff. You don't, you know, when you tag your content, you can find it. You can exercise institutional control over your stuff to make sure that you're you know, obeying the law. And 
you can repurpose your stuff. So when a lot of our faculty, when they put their learning objects into Equella, they make them available so that other people, if they find them, they could link them in their course if they wanted. One very specific example of this is I worked with a professor in the chemistry department who had created these really nice podcasts. And uh, he put his in Equella. I was working with our tutoring center and I said, hey, here's an example of something that someone's uh, done in Equella. And I said, look at all these chemistry tutorials. We're not talking about an insignificant amount, probably close to 100 um, podcasts that he generated, screencasts. And I said, well, we can use those. So what is the value of repurposing? It's a lot. Okay? When your stuff's just um, you know, hidden in different silos, you might have some very valuable things that could be repurposed and leveraged across your campus. And then, of course, you can provide context. The tagging, I, I explain it to the faculty, I say, well, you know, I'm used to this hierarchical folder structure on my computer. And I say, look, when you go to YouTube, you don't have a hierarchical folder structure because there's too much stuff. You have to tag the content and then you can search and find it. And that seems to help them. And um, with that, let me just say I call it the 80-20 choice. I could probably find a different content system uh, that would deliver photographs better than Equella does. However, that's the only thing that it can do. Okay, that's one example. But we have, or I could find a system to deal with faculty content that might be a little bit better than what Equella does. But that's the only thing that it does. And in the other example, the special collections and archives, there is special collections and archives software out there, but Equella works pretty well for it. So why should I buy another one? So we've been able to achieve our goals of limiting the number of content systems and do more than just provide a learning object uh, repository, but a content system for the entire campus. So we can, we can, we can reach the 80% of each of the different use cases, we're not as worried about the 20 because we think it's worth the trade-off instead of buying five or six or seven different content management systems. So with that, let me just say that it's been a pleasure speaking to you today and good luck in your future with content management. And I think we're gonna open it up for questions now. Is that right, Chris? Uh, we got one more slide here. I'll just go ahead and move on. Uh, Thank you, Matt, for, um, for that overview of how BYUI uses Aquila. It is, it is always interesting to hear, um, especially longtime users of Aquila, um, what they've been able to accomplish with it. If this webinar has interest you in, interested you in Aquila um, and you have a desire to take a look at the community, possibly join the community, um, we encourage you to do so. Um, We've listed a couple um, couple links here to help get you started. Uh, the Aperio Open Aquila website is listed up there, I and mean, then that'll give you kind of a landing page and a high-level overview and go into more detail of all the various components of Open Aquila. Uh, there are two Google groups set up, one for more of the developer discussions and one for kind of um, pretty much any other discussion for end users and whatnot. Um, there is an Open Aquila Slack channel out there. And then for any of the, um, the, the bugs or the enhancements that folks work on, we use the GitHub issues tracker, and then, then all the, co the code is stored in GitHub as well. Um, and then there's also a Twitter handle for it. Um, I would say that the Google Groups at this point is the most used, so feel free to jump on and, um, and start getting familiar if you'd like to. And with that, we'll go ahead and open it up to any questions, and we will do our best to provide answers. Um, due, to the, um, due to the technology we're using for the webinar, please go ahead and type your questions in the chat, and then we will, um, we will read them off and answer them. I'm just going over to the chat window now. So we'll open up for me, there we go. All right. 
I'm just taking a look. And really, we only have one comment here, and I'll go ahead and read it. This is from Amalia Flores. She said, hi, everyone. I just wanted to thank Chris and Matt. It's been a great explanation. I just want to know, how did you get Aquila working for library subscription content? Can you go ahead and take that one, Matt? Sure. So there's a couple ways that we're using library subscription content. Most libraries, as you may know, purchase uh, databases of, of you know, videos, of newspapers, uh, scholarly journals, and the like, in these big collections that they make available through their library search. But we find there are a lot of situations where we're buying individual books on top of that. Okay, so, or we might be uh, buying access to a video or uh, some other, or, or some images. And so what we do is for all those one-offs, we put them in Equella, and then what you can do with Equella is, you know, you're like, well, how do your users then find that through your library search? Well, we, we export the metadata for Equella into our library search. So we make things that are in Equella searchable within the library search. Um, one example that I didn't show you today is we have kind of a special arrangement with Harvard, the Harvard Business Case Studies, because uh, our former president had been, uh, Kim Clark, had been president of the Harvard Business School. So when he became the president of BYU-Idaho, he worked out a deal with them that allowed us to host the Harvard Business Case Studies here in our library. Now, as far as I know, we're the only ones that they allowed to do that. But we had to prove to them that we could um, secure their content and also give them accurate use statistics for that content. So our uh, business faculty use a lot of simulations from Harvard and a lot of these business case studies. They reside in Equella, and then they take those links and put them in their course. And then using the reporting structure from Equella, we can give them very accurate use statistics on how many times those different reports have been accessed for a certain time period. So there's a, there's a couple of, of examples. Um, also, uh, faculty sometimes create content that they don't mind other people on campus using, but they don't want uh, people outside campus using without paying licensing, because they, they create textbooks and other things which they make available um, to students in their courses for free, but they're not available outside there for free. So they'll host those as a, as a PDF, for example, those books as a PDF um, in Equella, and uh, then they'll just use those links. Now those, those can also be found in our library search, but when you go to click on it uh, to, to access the item in Equella, you'll get challenged, so you'll have to enter your uh, NetID and password, your user ID and password. Is, is that uh, answer your question, or do you have a more specific uh, library use case that you wanted me to address? I'll just give Amalia a minute. Okay, and she responded with that it does so far. Thanks a lot. So that yeah. worked. Thank you, Matt. So if I could just Amalia, add, also, oh, go ahead. I just wanted to add to that that we we also have a lot of other content that we put in Equella that we make available in our library search besides licensed content. And one really good example is that we have digitized all of our books that are in the public domain. Uh, we've worked with the Internet Archive, and I don't know if you're familiar with the Internet Archive, but our books are sitting out there digitized on the Internet Archive. Well, how are, how are our you know, students and faculty going to know about those books? Well, what we do is we catalog all those items. We can, we can export all the metadata from the Internet Archive, and we can import that into, into Equella, along with the links back to those items. They're all free. And we also make that available through our library search. We export that metadata into our library search. So those items are available as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Amalia also writes, uh, she says, also I want to confirm if Aquila Sync is available at 6.6. .6. And I can go ahead and, um, and speak to that. 
So BYUI um, was willing to open source Aquila Sync. They did a uh, they did a um, a demo um, on one of the Unicon briefings, and they've shown it around before as well. Um, and we saw that uh, we we thought that it would be a really good fit for being open source. Um, and so they they were willing to do so, and they have like I said they they've given us access to the code. Um, once we review it and push the code out, then um, Aquila Sync will be available for any open source version of Aquila. So um, any open source version of Open Aquila, excuse me. So it's essentially it's Aquila 6.5, which was the first open source version. Um, Aquila 6.6 will work, and then just continuing on. It makes use of the APIs, um, and so it's it's fairly robust um, and future proof against changes. All right, well, I don't see any other questions coming in at this time. I just double check. Yep, no. All right. Well, I wanted to thank you for your time to come and listen to this webinar today. Uh, we, we are excited about Open Aquilo. We think it does, it can do a lot for institutions. Um, and we hope that you've um, been able to gather some excitement around it as well. Um, I appreciate, Matt, you taking the time out of your schedule to come and, um, and talk to us about how um, how BYU Idaho has utilized Aquila, and um, and go ahead and look for uh, rebroadcasts um, of this webinar um, coming soon from Unicon. All right, thanks, Chris.